Greetings to all, and welcome to the Jamaica Diaspora Show. My name is Mark Millward of the West Indian Social Club of Hartford, and I'm your host. The Jamaica Diaspora Show is aimed at providing viewers with coverage of diaspora news and activities in a variety of areas, including business, arts, health, education, entertainment, politics, immigration, trade, and investment. Our first show featured an exclusive interview with the most honorable Andrew P. Holness, Prime Minister of Jamaica, who talked about the Economic Growth Council and harnessing the power of the diaspora. Tune in for more coverage in the future on the activities of the Economic Growth Council and diaspora engagement. Hartford, Connecticut is the third largest population of Jamaicans in the United States behind Miami and New York. We intend to provide our viewing audience with global diaspora perspectives and coverage from the US, UK, Canada, Jamaica, and of course the Caribbean. Please join us weekly, Saturdays at 2 p.m. and Sundays at 3 p.m. on Hartford Public Access Television, providing global television network coverage at www.hpatv.org. Welcome to the Jamaica Diaspora Show. Today I have two very, very special guests. I have with me today Ms. Veronica Airy Wilson and Dr. Claire Nelson. Welcome to the Jamaica Diaspora Show. Thank We're you. on location, ladies and gentlemen, in Hartford, Connecticut at the uh, Harvard Public Access TV studio. And today our show is focused on National Caribbean American Heritage Month. This is the national show. Dr. Claire Nelson is the convening chair for National Caribbean American Heritage Month. The Hartford audience is very familiar with Ms. Veronica Airy Wilson, but I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves. So let's start with Ms. Veronica Airy Wilson. It's a pleasure to be here. As you well know, I, I've grown, I've been in Hartford for up teens here, years. I actually grew up here. Uh, I'm the former deputy mayor for the city of Hartford. I've served on the Hartford City Council for 17 years. I was the first female president of the West Indian Social Club for an organization that is now 69 years old. That was back a few years ago, obviously. Uh, but Hartford is home. I love it here. I currently run a area insurance group agency, one of the Allstate franchises. It's still my way of giving back to the community, making sure that folks are fully insured and take advantage of all the opportunities that exist to make sure they take proper care of their family. I'm not sure how many uh, uh, viewers, particularly in the Harvard area, know your educational background. Could you Tell us your, your educational background. Oh, sure. As I indicated, I grew up in Hartford, mm -hmm. so I went to all the schools here. I'm a graduate of Weaver High School. Mm -hmm. Go Beavers. I left Weaver and went on to Ithaca College, mm -hmm. and I graduated from Ithaca early, uh, semester early, mm -hmm. and I graduated magna cum laude. Mm -hmm. It was very cold there. That was mm -hmm. part of why I <laughs> stuck to my lessons and mm -hmm. made sure mm -hmm. that I did very well. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Hartford and decided I was going to go to law school mm -hmm. and decided to start working for a while and it took off. And mm -hmm. I eventually found out that as much as a, as a kid, I kept saying I wanted to be a corporate lawyer mm -hmm. and that made my parents and all their friends very happy. Mm -hmm. But after working in the industry, I realized that really was not for me. So, so was your undergraduate political science? Political <laughs> <laughs> history and political oh, science. Okay. I had history mm -hmm. there as a backup, thinking that maybe mm -hmm. I could teach. Mm -hmm. And I spent a half a semester trying to teach. And even mm -hmm. in Ithaca, that country town, the kids in public school was 
outrageous. I I would have been in, cure, <laughs> arrested for child abuse or something. <laughs> I I really couldn't take the uh, way kids were on discipline, mm -hmm. especially at my Caribbean background where teachers are placed on a pedestal and mm -hmm. they're really respected. It's really sad to see somehow in the school systems here kids uh, don't respect their teachers. So mm -hmm. I gave up on that. Okay. But <laughs> well, well, now, now, Dr. Nelson, now you, uh, let's talk, let's have your introduction, please. Well, very quickly, um, I came to America as a well-formed teenager uh, to go to school in the University of Buffalo. So oh, <laughs> also a cold. Really a cold. <laughs> also a cold place. In fact, I, my first winter was the blizzard of 77. So I got baptism by cold. And I, from there, I went on to Purdue University and then onward to um, work at the Inter-American Development Bank. And while there, I continued my studies and got my doctorate in engineering and management. So I'm a proud Boilermaker. I'm proud um, um, Buffalo grad. I'm proud engineer. And um, really, I have no regrets about taking that decision to study industrial engineering. Mm -hmm. At the time, I thought I was going to become the Minister of Industrial and Planning in Jamaica mm -hmm. and just make everything run, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but I ended up engineering social change instead. So uh -huh. I would say, I like to tell people I'm a, some, a social engineer mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. And let's talk, okay, now you are also the founder and president of the uh, Institute of Caribbean, Caribbean Studies. Studies. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, back when I was a young Turk, um, we used to have a lot of, up, uh, but I would know, for example, when the ministers are coming up from Caribbean region. And because I grew up in a very political era in Jamaica, in the Michael Mann era, we were going to change things era. I was that kind of person that was very cause driven. And so I, uh, from a very early age, wanted to see the diaspora engage. And so I used to try and get the ministers to meet with them after work, you know, for social events. And what would happen that sometimes the existing organizations would say, I wait till the last minute to tell them and they can't do it. So one of my friends said one day, you know, we used to start our own organization. I said, yeah, we're going to start our own organization. So there was me and about six men. I said, Claire and also and the six mermen. <laughs> So now this is this is your involvement in in Caribbean affairs. This yes, is how it's it got started. Got started. But before that, I was into my dance and drama. I was well known for my cultural, you know, performances. I was a playwright, storyteller, my ah. folk dance, folk performance. Oh, okay. And so that's really what I what I had originally wanted to do in my spare time. But I think as a young 30-year-old, I resented the fact that many of the men would put a good partner in my head, not invite me to what I call the serious discussions. I'm going to just come and dance and skin teeth. Ah! Mm -hmm. I'm like, hell no. So <laughs> therefore, when my friend, actually a young man, said, you know, I'm, you're going to start some, I'll help you. You'll be the president, I'll be the vice president. I said, sure. Yeah, <laughs> so right. Yeah. Next thing you know, we are, you got this lawyer, you know, putting our money. And we met at the office of this Barbadian American who at the time had one of the most successful minority um, consulting firms doing work in development with mm -hmm. State Department and AID and those groups on, a, on 18th and on I Street. And we basically got started. 1993 was the first meeting in March, and by October we were official. And by June 1994, we had our first official event, piggybacking on, at the time, there used to be something the World Bank would convene called the Caribbean Group for Economic Cooperation and Development. Mm -hmm. And all the donors would come to Washington. So I knew beforehand, right? So I would prep the ministers who I would have met at different cocktail parties, et cetera, and say, hey, we're having this side event. Can mm -hmm. you come? Because I recognized that was what other groups would do, but we weren't doing that. Yeah. So can you imagine the first year we're having the first ever um, Caribbean Economic um, Symposium at the, at the time it was called the International Club, which is actually where CSIS, mm -hmm. one of the big Washington think tanks, um, mm -hmm. used to have this auditorium or rented space there. And I was able to attract the Minister of Finance of Barbados. We had the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. This is our first official event. I mean, I was like, I was a tremor, mm -hmm. nervous wreck. <laughs> and the last uh, big thing that happened was in walks at the first event, Congressman Maxine Waters, our first event. Wow. And there is this historic shot of myself, her, mm -hmm. and then um, Jamaican woman who's in my car, I can't remember, I'm missing her face, but she was the first female banker in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And there it is, her pictures came out in the Guinea front page. Three powerful women in Washington. <laughs> so I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my God. Mm -hmm. So it was really like an affirmation 
that this idea could have legs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And despite the fact that I have been actually laughed at, this man told me, you have no funding? <laughs> it's never going to work. <laughs> I think that is what kept me going. Uh, because mm -hmm. when you tell somebody something's not going to work. Mm -hmm. They make more determined to yeah. do it. They're more determined. And so here we are mm -hmm. 25 years later. Many of the people have moved on, but they're mm -hmm. still in our orbit as advisors or, mm -hmm. you know, they join different committees. And I think the original board member only have one person beside myself. Well, wow. you know, I always wanted to ask you, what was your, you, you have your PhD in, in, in engineering. Yeah. What was your uh, dissertation subject matter? What was that? It was on um, whole, systems, whole systems technology assessment for industrial projects in developing countries. Mm -hmm. I was concerned that the world that you know how it is, we borrow all this money mm -hmm. and it's a white elephant. Mm. And I thought, well that's because we're not doing proper analysis or impact assessments. And for example, you design a project and it's all going to build this um, hospital. You haven't thought about who's going to fix the things when the things go bad. You don't have a life cycle management. So this is why I thought mm -hmm. doing this work where I looked at social impact, environmental impact, this is long before these things became fashionable. Yeah. It was new. So in those days, mm -hmm. the idea of doing social impact, environmental impact, life cycle as part of a development project assessment was new. Mm -hmm. okay. Believe it or not. Okay. 1990, <laughs> okay. not mm -hmm. so long ago. All right. Now, now, now Veronica. Um, first female president of the West Indian Social Club. You know, we've had this conversation before for this all-male organization. Can you please tell us your growth uh, within this organization? And, <laughs> and, and really, what, 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 well, now that I know that your undergraduate degree was in political science, you know, that tells me oh, something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it came in very handy. That. Actually, I grew up in the organization. I came here when I was eight years old. And it was a difficult adjustment for uh, Caribbean children at that time, period. Uh, my brother and I were the only two West Indians, Jamaicans, in our school. Mm -hmm. And we were picked on and bullied every single the day. The only two? The yeah. only two mm -hmm. in 1960. Wow. Wow. And uh, so... With now, my, what school was this? This was Brackett Northeast. Okay. And uh, so... Our parents said, we're not sending you to school to worry about fashion or k other kids. All we want is for you to get a good education. So we grew up hearing this. Mm. And so the only little pleasure we had uh, after being locked away all week studying in our rooms was on the weekends. Mm -hmm. My father would load us up in the station wagon and either take us to the farms, these are the tobacco farms where his friends or acquaintances were mm -hmm. working, that was our Sunday treat, or to the park to watch cricket. He went to watch cricket, we knew nothing about cricket, so we would run around in the fields and play tag or something. But I always knew all the men in the organization, not even, not many women because there wasn't a lot of West Indian women here and the American women weren't interested in cricket. Mm -hmm. They may pop in um, into the park once in a while just to see what's going on. But the kids were there always mm -hmm. playing around. So I kind of grew up in that environment. And by the time we got to high school, there were more Caribbean kids coming mm -hmm. into the community. So I got this idea along with Leslie Perry, who was a young West Indian club member at the time. He was the youth leader, and I was one of the presidents of the organization. And the idea was to introduce the kids who were born here and the kids who were coming to try to pull them together to see if, you know, we can get along better and if we can learn about each other culture we wouldn't be so um, negative uh, and, and there would, the bullying would cut down because over those years it continued. Mm. So my job as president of uh, that, the organization is to try to uh, introduce the larger population to our culture, the true culture, not that we were monkeys swinging from trees or we came here on the banana boat or, mm -hmm. you know, those were kind of mm -hmm. like the stereotypes mm -hmm. at the time. So because of that, Growing up in the organization, I got to be introduced to all the men and their involvement. And they were all with uncle this, uncle that. In addition, my parents' home served as a home away from home for many of them. Because again, 
it was the home where all the parties were kept. Um, mm -hmm. These institutions mm -hmm. that you see around now, the Italian Club, the Jewish Center, these were places where we would rent for the first time. Mm -hmm. Black folks would rent. And, but you had to be out by 11, 12 o'clock. The events would, that was the time things closed down in Hartford. So pe our people are accustomed to longer parties, so they would come to our home. My parents would cook. My mom would cook the curry goat before she went to the dances. Mm -hmm. And my father would clean out the two rooms, the dining room and the living room, and prepare it for dancing. We would select the music earlier in that day and when he got home, my father served as the bartender. My mom was in the kitchen with my sister, and mm -hmm. she's the chef, and she's serving the food. And I, sometimes in pajama, was the DJ. <laughs> so <laughs> there was this, you know, you used to have the old time hi-fi, so mm -hmm. you would stack the mm -hmm. records up eight at oh a time and watch them drop down. And mm -hmm. after a set of fast music would go, then we'd go to a set of slow music. <laughs> and so that is how we entertain mm -hmm. the community. So I really got to understand and learn about my father and my mother's uh, um, friends. Mm -hmm. So being part of the West Indian Social Club as a little girl growing up, I went off to college, I came back, and women were still, when I came back in 1975 from college, women were still not formal members of the organization. Mm -hmm. They were only part of as an auxiliary. Right. Wow. They would raise the money and give to the men to spend, but they were not officially uh, part of the organization. And after a few years, uh, they saw the light. I still think they just wanted the monies that were in the coffers <laughs> that the women <laughs> raised, but they saw the light and they decided that they were going to incorporate everyone into one. But women, women were actually, you know, the backbone, you know, behind. They the were men. very anyway. active. They were mm -hmm. certainly they put on their teas and their fashion shows. But mm -hmm. where the major decisions were being made about the organization, maybe at home they influenced their husband in some way, mm -hmm. but they were not allowed into the formal meetings. Well, you know, the yeah. the West Indian Social Club as a, as a community organization um, has has been instrumental in developing the entire region. That is an area that I would like you to speak to in terms of, this is not, we're talking about National Caribbean American Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the contributions that Caribbean Americans have made, not only in the development of this country, but you know, in the development of communities. Significant, significant right here in Hartford. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that I remember, the stories that I heard, is the, when the men from the Caribbean came to Connecticut, they came as farm workers, and they weren't familiar. The African-American men were away at war, and so that was the purpose for them coming here, serve as part of the manpower program. But they weren't familiar with the boundaries. Even in the Northeast, there were boundaries as to where blacks could go, where they could live. You know, it wasn't as um, formal as maybe in the South, but it existed. So when they came to town for the first time, they didn't know that there was an area they were supposed to go to that's where black folks party and entertain. So the first bar they saw was the Arrowhead, an Italian-owned place, and they go in and they drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, two of them at the time. And he noticed, one of the men noticed that every time they finished a glass, it would be scooped up. And uh, the guy would take it to the back, and he's thinking, Wow, why are they washing these glasses so often? So he followed him and he noticed he was throwing the glass out the window onto the railroad track because the thought there is after black folks drink out of this glass, they're not going to drink out of it. Mm -hmm. So the guy didn't, they didn't say anything. They leave and they go back to the farms and the next week they bring a bus of all the men now and they all come in. Of course, these guys are wondering, what are all these black folks doing here? And the guy said to the owner, Last week we saw you throwing away those glasses. So if you plan to throw glasses away every time we drink, you're going to be finished. This place is going to be emptied out. Are you that, serious? Yeah. What? And they had they ended up serving them. I think this needs to be a movie, don't you think? Listen, this, I'm, needs to be this a was movie. one of the first impact I think when I think mm -hmm. about it wow. of breaking That's the culture, you mm -hmm. know, this so-called color barrier. Mm -hmm. And it turned story. out that these Italian owners 
became very good friends with these mm -hmm. um, West Indians, predominantly Jamaicans. He, they started cashing their checks when they got paid on the farms. Mm -hmm. They helped them to buy cars. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, they benefit too because you're buying it from yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And they, get, they only had to pay mm -hmm. a little each, each week. And when it was time to go home, they, um, United States says, well, thank you. You know, it's time for you to go back. They arranged spe special marriages that, you know, mm -hmm. that they would mm -hmm. marry American right. women mm -hmm. so that they could stay here. Mm -hmm. So they became uh, really good friends with these Italians over the years, and they helped them through the, you know, staying here. In large part, we had a, a very, very large Italian community. Yeah, it, yeah, we it, did, and, conti and continue. Yes. Continue. Mm -hmm. The other, uh, another significant change is the Bond Hotel in downtown Hartford. Mm -hmm. Again, these men had no idea that black folks never really went downtown. Mm -hmm. Again, because their entertainment was all along Windsor Street, mm -hmm. um, cotton clubs, just like you would see a lot of jazz and a lot of entertainment. So the first famous West Indian people. social club anniversary ball was at the Bond Hotel. At the Bond Hotel. Okay, now this was that the uptown, first, basically. was that the this first? Downtown, downtown, yeah. This was is a white owned establishment. Black. The first time any black folks had had anything major in that, wow. other than working there. That was the first, and mm -hmm. that's been established. That was another barrier. Major. Yeah, and from there they moved on to owning homes in the mm -hmm. Blue Hills area, where very few black folks ever lived because mm -hmm. after a while, you ne first you never passed Main Street, mm -hmm. and then when the Jews moved on, we kind of patterned, followed the Jews as they moved around, and then they moved on, then it was you can't pass Vine Street, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, then mm -hmm. before you know it, we were in Blue Hills. And they also worked a lot for the, um, the Jews in their homes and in their fields and um, Clubs um, in the movies, movie mm -hmm. theater. They used to have drive-in theater. My father used to work for them. And so when it was time they wanted to sell and move on, they chose to mm -hmm. sell to a lot of the West Indians first because they had worked with them and kind of knew their work ethics or, you know, some of them held back the mortgage so that if they didn't do well, they could get the houses back. Mm -hmm. But they broke the West Indian folks in Hartford broke down a lot of barriers. Well, now I'm going to I'm going to fast forward a little bit because I want to know. You know, I was born into the organization, so. Mm -hmm. uh, but and and then I, as a child, and th then I went away, and then I came back. Okay, after many years, I was absent for many years, so I missed the the point in time when uh, the West Indian Social Club connected with the in Institute of Caribbean Studies. So can you tell talk can you talk about that how how that connection that came about this this woman <laughs> <laughs> really she <clears throat> is a dynamo mm -hmm. I don't think there's an organization in these United States that uh, where Caribbean mm -hmm. folks live that she have not made connection with and uh, so Una Clark uh, mm -hmm. We started an organization that was called Caribbean Elected um, Officials, and we started, we had a chance to visit Washington, but Dr. Claire Nelson reached out to us here in Hartford when she started to champion Caribbean Heritage Month, long sure. before it was even um, instituted so, formally. All right, but now that that's like 2004 or no, that's before? way before that. That's way before she, yes. yeah, she yeah. was so, fighting for this cause yeah. long before it ever materialized. So what, what year are we talking? I don't know. I think I first met uh, her back in 1994, 95. I think we honored her as one of the first Caribbean American elected officials. Mm -hmm. Because from day one, ICS purpose was never supposed to be social. It was about how do we engage the diaspora in changing the conversation. Remember, we were founded just when the Reagan era had just gone by, and you had all these pundits on TV talking about how the Caribbean was going to go communist. And I just sit down and talk back to the TV and vex. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> how come I don't come ask me nothing? So ISIS was founded part in response to that. So Una Clark was one of the people I reached out to early in the day. Um, 
I wanted because the second person because they were elected officials. It was very important for me as a young person to kind of tap into these already, let's say, places of power to see how would we come together because we, again, we're doing it bootstrapping. There's no funding. There's no corporation. There's no foundation. It's all bootstrapped. And I think just knowing that you have that sort of support from somebody who's an elected official as mm -hmm. a young person makes you take your own self seriously. So mm -hmm. even if you're afraid, you're like, well, and especially, you know, Jamaica, mm -hmm. your shame tree can be very big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can't go and call somebody and say you're going to do something, and then you'll mm -hmm. drop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so you met through UNA? Clark. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, and absolutely. Tell our viewers, our international viewers, in fact, who UNA Clark is. UNA uh, Clark is uh, one of the first Caribbean persons to be elected to the Hartford, uh, I'm sorry, the New York City Council. Very dynamic woman from Brooklyn. Uh, very active. She's now a doctor also. And her vision was not only to improve the wherewithal of the folks, the Caribbean folks in Brooklyn, but all over these United States. And she felt power lie within the Caribbean community if we can only work together and function together. And politics is, was the key. Mm -hmm. uh, second probably only to education, but she wanted to see all the Caribbean elected officials come together to empower ourselves and to make changes. Locally, she felt we can only impact where we're from if we can have some say here where we live. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. And she adopted me mm -hmm. <laughs> as a young person. She's an older uh, woman. Mm -hmm. and, and she adopted me as a young person. And she said, together, Veronica, we are going to unite these, this country. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got started. And, and, and by the way, she's the mother of Congress. That's Congress. what I was going to yes, ask. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, right. yes. Great example. Okay. Yes. Now, now, before we get into more of the specifics on Caribbean American Heritage Month, I want to I'd like to know more about ICS programs and your goals and well, your right objectives. Well, right now, well, well, for the first 25 years, this the first 20 years, I was, again, working full time. And because of the, the politics of things, there's certain things that we couldn't do. So we focused a lot on advocacy. Mm -hmm. And we started doing events on the Hill back in 1999. We had our first White House event in 1999. Mm -hmm. But every year, basically, we always had an event around development agenda at home and development agenda at home. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's at home that's over there and there's at home that's over here. Mm -hmm. Because we can't help at home if we're not healthy here. So we always had a domestic and foreign policy agenda, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so more recent in the last five years, having left the Inter-American Development Bank where I worked, we're much more visible now in the development space. Mm -hmm. How can we get Caribbean diaspora organizations moving from just social thinking into number one, claiming ground here in America. So our mentorship of leaders around the country to become point persons and focal points for Caribbean American Heritage Month, to use the month as a political organizing space. So there's some people who are seeing it as a social thing, but those who I'm able to convince use it to not only have, yes, we have our social events or festivals, but the festival, you should have the mayor at the festival. Mm -hmm. If you have a sem summit on healthcare, you need to have your Department of Healthcare people. So you are showing that you're part of the society. Mm -hmm. And so now, as we look to the future, we're very focused on this concept of building a smart Caribbean without borders. Mm -hmm. Because if we t try to move from brain drain mm -hmm. with all the genius scientists and engineers and lawyers that we have here, we can move it to a point of brain gain if we are able to link the intellectual capital along with some of our financial capital to put for investment back in the region. And so we're using the United Nations Agenda 2030 mm -hmm. as a sort of a, as a guide to help us, number one, organize our thoughts. We're also using the new law that the US government has passed that says the US State Department must consult or should consult with diaspora and making a strategy. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, ICS has emerged as the leading diaspora organization to partner to provide State Department the ease of the consultation process. Our white paper was accepted by them in 2017. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's known as the Diaspora Companion Paper, which has informed the first three years. So now for us, it's how do we identify, as I say, these intellectual bright spots and sparks 
to form the working groups that can follow on the implementation process and provide advice to the U.S. agencies that do work in the region. So we're very focused on development and we're organized around the same agendas, diplomacy, prosperity, education, health, energy, and I think I'm missing one. Economic, well, prosperity is economic uh, yes. development. Yeah. Well, okay, well, let's... Uh, security. How security. could I forget? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Security. Well, um, that's, that's very, very insightful. Let's, uh, let's take a break right now. because and, and then after this break, we're going to talk more about how National Caribbean American Heritage Month got started yeah. and Congresswoman uh, Barbara, Barbara Lee. Lee. Yes. We'll, be, we'll, we'll be right back. We'll be right back with uh, more talk on National Caribbean American Heritage Month with Dr. Clara Nelson and Ms. Veronica Airy Wilson. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Carrie Ann Henry. I just wanted to send a big shout out to the West Indian Social Club on your 69th anniversary. And just to say that I, uh, coming from the diaspora and being a Jamaican who has lived abroad before, I really celebrate the work that you do in terms of adding to the energy and the tradition and legacy of the Caribbean and keeping that focus and initiative. And I just want to say all the best and to have a great ball. I also want to celebrate with you National Caribbean American Heritage Month and just to also celebrate that because your campaign from the first in 2004 and now it's 2019, 15 years of really wonderful work. So big up to you, celebrate the Caribbean and all the best from Jamaica. And we're back on the Jamaica Diaspora Show and I'm here with Ms. Veronica Airy Wilson and Dr. Claire Nelson. And this show is focused on National Caribbean American Heritage Month. Dr. Nelson, just please describe for our viewers the evolution of National Caribbean American Heritage well, Month. Well, what is what I must say is exciting to me is that I'm hearing stuff that I didn't even remember existed. I don't remember talking to her long before the actual thing happened. Mm -hmm. Sure, mm -hmm. sometimes your memory is faulty. What I do remember is that with the Clinton White House, I had a, a friend who was the outreach for African American. And she said to me, um, it's 1999 now, um, how come you people don't have a month? And I'm like, boy, we mm -hmm. want to have one. How do you do that? She said, I'll help you. So I was busy trying to write something to, for her to get to Clinton to do. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, a Jamaican woman in D.C. was trying to get D.C. to have Caribbean Heritage Month. And so she called me one day to the club and said, hey, I'm trying to Caribbean Heritage Month. Well, I'm doing Caribbean Heritage Month. I'm doing D.C. I'm doing National. I'm doing June. I'm doing August. And she said, well, you need to come and do June with me because mm -hmm. at least we'll get it started somewhere. <laughs> start, start somewhere. I'm like, oh, but it's August. It's Independence. She said, no, no, but we can't pick a big month because we can't pick August because if you pick August, then it's going to be like Jamaican month, and then we're going to promote all small islands. And you have point there, point well taken. So June, when we looked at June, really it made sense because we didn't have any big islands having an event. We didn't have, let's say, any big conflict where people would feel like one group is going to take it over. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of year when it's warm, mm -hmm. right? You couldn't have a cabinet this month, like in February, so it, or March. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it had to be a warm month. And so I said, sure. And basically... Um, subsequent to that, she kind of pulled out of doing stuff in D.C. because most people didn't get what she was trying to do at the time. And now by this time, now I'm fired up because my White House friend told me she would help me. So mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to try to see. It didn't work in 1999. I'm going to try for the year 2000. So nothing is going on. I put up, I organized the first, what I call it, the Caribbean Children's Carnival. I put this sign up. Caribbean Heritage, Caribbean American Heritage Month. Please come. Well, nobody came. Like nine children came. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? 2001, what can I do that's going to make more people see the flyer? Ah, film festival. So I started the DC Caribbean Festival and I put on it in honor of Caribbean American <laughs> Heritage Month. <laughs> now, there was no such thing legally, uh -huh. but hey, uh -huh. you got to stay grown, right? Uh -huh. And so myself, a guy from M M M Malawi, who was very much into black film, uh -huh. a woman from Trinidad, a woman from Cuba, of Caribbean Heritage, and a woman from St. Lucia. We just putter puttered every year with her like a small film festival and the flyer go up in honor of Cal American Heritage Month. Well, God smiled on me. And a young lady who worked in Barbara's Is this 2006? 
No, this is below get there yet. This okay. is 2003 okay. now. Okay. A young woman who worked in Babali's office comes to me and says, you know, my parents are from the, from the Caribbean. I was talking to my boss, and she really wants to do a Caribbean American Heritage Month. Can you help me? I said, is the Pope Catholic? So we <laughs> sat at my dining table, mm -hmm. and she said, you can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody, because I'm still learning how the hill works, right? So on the hill, people are very jealous about their bills. So if they're help, asking you to help them craft something, you really can't tell anybody because they're afraid that someone will take a dump Steal it. and put mm -hmm. the bill before their idea. So uh, my lips were sealed until February 2004. The first bill is launched mm -hmm. with Barbara Lee. And why Barbara Lee? She basically had as her mentor Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. Oh, right, right. Okay. And she really wanted to honor her memory, her legacy, her contributions. She really understood that America's black community was a multicultural one mm -hmm. and that the Caribbean people had a role to play. And she also understood the politics of the changing thing mm -hmm. in America. So she, when we did have a chance to talk, understood also that I was not interested only in it for the social issue, mm -hmm. but also to have an organizing for, space. For our international viewers, you know, because now we're US, UK, and Canada. Tell them who uh, Congresswoman uh, Barbara well, Congresswoman Barbara Lee is Lee. best known for being the sole congressperson to not vote to go to war in Iraq back in the time, I think, when Colin Paul had gone to, mm -hmm. to the United Nations. So she's from Oakland, California, and no, she does not have Caribbean roots. Mm -hmm. So her Caribbean roots are her love for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, which she mm -hmm. worked for. Mm -hmm. And then it was her working for Congresswoman Chisholm that got her involved in politics oh. and made her decide to run herself. Mm -hmm. So now she's been on the Hill for umpteen years and mm -hmm. is really a leader in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so it was because of her effort and her staff member, mm -hmm. Jamila Thompson, who has um, Bahamian roots, mm -hmm. that of course she, because her roots are Caribbean, she made extra effort and were able to get so many co-signers. Mm -hmm. And on the Senate side, we got Chuck Schumer to put it forward and it went for at the same time a bill was going for January to be Jewish American Heritage Month and April to be Arab American Heritage Month. And so whether or not it was because nobody noticed us, we don't really care, but it kind of went through on the, on the Senate side on February 14, 2005. Mm -hmm. Wow, I was so excited. Mm -hmm. So now we have to, no, February 2006. Okay. So now we All have right. to push now to get the president. And that was a race to the finish. Mm -hmm. I mean, May we're meeting with the Bush White House, like, we don't even, we have Pan American Day, that's not the same. We mm -hmm. have this day, it's not the same. And now people are calling from around the country, I'm getting people to call in. And this is why if you look on the congressional record, you will see in July or late June of 2000, you see a list of organizations that as people were calling in to Congressman Lee's office, they were added to the roster of supporting organizations. So the, the, these are the... Uh uh, initial organizations you had uh, inaugural your inaugural events in uh, well they all didn't come but they certainly called mm. in to make sure because yes. the actual proclamation was signed on June 6 2006 the original 666 mm -hmm. was our day mm -hmm. and so we were ecstatic we had a reception at the Bush White House that first year mm -hmm. and I must give credit in this place to a gentleman named Tony Powell Clive T Tony Powell who, um, by all intents of purposes, looked African American, sounded African American, but actually came here when he was three. Mm -hmm. And so when he had met me, he was the food security um, chief in the White House. Mm -hmm. And so he worked well for the Clinton White House, so he knew me from the Clinton days. And so he had walked me through the back door mm -hmm. to the Bush White House and say, Hey guys, we're taking my sister here. <laughs> 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 and so the African American gentlemen who were like young, I'm like, you know, why y'all want to be different from us? You think you're not black? Yes, no, we know it's not about it's not about race. It's about the third border issues, it's about our culture, it's about the immigration issue. And I think we're eventually able to um, find the common ground. And so they did have a reception. And it was really a very momentous occasion. And people come down from New York, people come down from Florida you know really a good occasion where we came together as one and started this new chapter if you will uh -huh. I would say in our history so i want to think of the years 2004 to 2006 as like a turning point mm -hmm. and our transformational change of how do we organize to stake claim on america mm -hmm. all right so that that's that's my next question is i think you already answered but i'm going to ask it anyway why a, a caribbean american heritage month 
Why? We have Black History Month. Why a Caribbean American Heritage Month? You know, from my perspective, it's about, again, the policy. We are, there's a lot of foreign policy stuff that I think, just like how the Jews have control, well, actually, the control is the wrong word. Let me rephrase that. The Jews have an influence over what happens with U.S. foreign policy towards Israel. Now, here we are in America's third border. We prefer that term than the Caribbean Basin, because in the Caribbean, the Basin is something that somebody washed them foot in, so we don't want to be nobody Basin. Uh -uh. So as, Caribbean, as America's third border, we want to have us as taxpayers and voters and descendants of immigrants participate in, in defining what that relationship should look like. We don't want to be on the wrong end of the stick as we were in this quote unquote the socialism years when many of our countries were destabilized etc because we didn't have this like dialogue of america and saying it's not what it looks like and so it's about first of all our visibility as a distinct subculture of the african-american culture because we are majority black that said we have caribbean people who are indian we have a lot of indo guyanese and indo Trinidadians who we take into account and so it's not about race we also want to have voice and our voice is about things that affect us as an immigrant group now obviously by the time you get to the grandparents like yourself like your kids mm -hmm. they're not going to have the same challenges as the first first gen people who have just come or the second gen mm -hmm. but we want to have voice as a voice of immigrants to make sure that the u.s policies around immigration continue to support fair and equitable justice around those issues and finally want to have agency i fully believe in this concept of america as sort of a, a proven ground for how the human family can work out our isms Mm -hmm. Think about America. I think we're very much on the forefront of social changes around race and class and gender and breaking down boundaries and barriers of all types. Mm -hmm. So despite the thorny road, if you see of the beginning of slavery and, um, and almost like say um, death of all the Native American people, America still is a good experiment in the last, let's say, 300 years of human history. Mm -hmm. And I like to tell a lot of people who are like, why should we bother with going back home? The fact is, if you're paying taxes and you're not active, you're still contributing to something that's not working. Mm -hmm. So you might as well take up your power and decide to take a stand and say what you want. Because in America, democracy is always becoming. There's no perfect union that's set. Mm -hmm. So it's always we're on our way to becoming a perfect union. Mm -hmm. And so this notion of, you know, going back to the past, but you can't go back to a past that was never that glorious for some people. Mm -hmm. We have to keep on becoming who we want to be. Okay, and so we I want to have influence that. I yeah. think it's also important for our children and our grandchildren to be familiar with our culture and to be proud of our culture. In a society like America, where all these different ethnic groups come together, the Italians never forget their culture, and that's passed down from generation to generation. The Jews don't forget their culture, and that's passed down from generation to the generation. Irish. The Irish, and even the Africans mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. come here also pass their culture. So I think it's important for the Caribbean Americans to also know their culture from whence they came, especially for our young people, to know from whence they're so, they so come. So do you, do you feel the month has, has grown to a, a level of significance where it's having the impact that, say, Not you envisioned? Yet. I think we have a long way to go. I think it's going to take at least 20 years, 25 mm -hmm. years, honestly. Because again, we're not funded, we're kind of self-funded, we're grassroots, we're bootstrapping. And most of the people who have been doing stuff like um, Lorna Shelton back in South Carolina or Chris Scott in Georgia and Valerie Summers in Georgia and you know, the people in Florida, Hazel Rogers and the guys in Tampa, all these people who have drinks of their bootstrapping. And we don't have any corporate support. But I think there's something to say about having the perseverance, mm -hmm. the stick to itiveness, the grit, mm -hmm. to have something so clear in your mind about the vision you want to create that you're willing to stick to it. And I think as more of us begin to see that we're stronger together than apart, especially in roads and choices America have to make right now to have, quote unquote, a thriving, flourishing future, we need to ensure that we continue to build on the, 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 
groups like Western Social Club, which actually stands as a as, as a lodestar of mm -hmm. Caribbean organize, or, or organizing. I think they are first of all one of the groups that has the most, let's say, substantial real estate holdings mm -hmm. in America as a Caribbean group. Mm -hmm. They have managed to survive you know, changes in organizational administration despite the challenges and not mm -hmm. fall apart. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to have them as a point to say, here's who we can become in our states. We have to think about how can we eventually have houses and cultural houses and art galleries and restaurants or a building where we can rent out a restaurant and rent out a steel band rehearsal center and a dance group center so that there's a space that is our f space, especially as cities become gentrified. Mm -hmm. And here in Hartford, and I hope this can spread across the country, when we talk about Caribbean Heritage Month, we include our Latino brothers right. and sisters exactly. from the Caribbean. Right. Exactly. So if there is uh, a forum, a seminar, we don't leave them out. They're all, we all come together in, in that celebration. Uh, uh, we and we June is probably the one mm -hmm. time when they really do, but we're hoping that because they come together in June, we mm -hmm. come together in June, that that will be expanded throughout the year. But, and, and people don't realize that the uh, Caribbeans are, are all ethnicities. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Not just people and, of and, color. And that's the opportunity. <laughs> exactly, during exactly. June we have Asian, see. we mm -hmm. have Indian, we have white. And mm -hmm. In fact, I think there's some of the was shot because they saw a white person speaking a Jamaican right, accent. Right, right, right. Like, no, 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 we actually, because mm -hmm. remember, we are melting pot culture. We're just mm -hmm. like, you know, America, where everybody came from everywhere to be in the Caribbean. Yeah. We just happened to migrate here. And to s agree with what you said, that's why the bill and the resolution never has the countries in it. Mm -hmm. We've never specified from day one what countries. So if you are Panamanian or Honduras and you say, look, I was born on the Caribbean coast, or I was born in the island of Raton, or I was born in the island of whatever, therefore I'm a Caribbean person. Hey, welcome Cuba. to the club. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so my next question is, what, what, what do we have to do to, to see that the, the the month grows and it it, uh, it becomes what you. We need to get more people like you interested in what we're doing yes. and to tell our story. We need to get more people joining with ISIS, joining the National Commemorative Committee. They tell people, I am not here to tell you what to do or what not to do, but I do say those people who have mentored, I do say, look, I definitely want you to. Your mayor needs to know who you are, you know. Uh -huh. you know. Your governor needs to know who you are, you know. Hey, your congressperson needs to know who you are, you know. So I do mentor people into that mm -hmm. space. Now, everybody doesn't want to go there. It's frightening for some people. But it's always good to have people doing their theater, their plays. What I, however, don't want is to see Cabin Heritage Month kind of devolve into some kind of wet t-shirt party, jump and wave, wine and dancing. Mm -hmm. That's not what our hard work no. is about. And so mm -hmm. we want to build that coalition of the willing and alliance of the able mm -hmm. to work together despite our different borders and boundaries of uh, being. Okay. All right. Now, now I, I have to ask the National uh, Commemorative Committee? Yes. Th is that a still a functional committee? And yes, what, functional committee. what is it their so purpose and what they're doing? Basically, the goal of that is to allow us to, a space to learn to work as a team. So, for example, I ask people to support each other, to share information. So, let's say, for example, you're doing a program at, at a library and a new group comes on board. I say, hey, can you coach this person on how to do a program at a library? Um, we also try to get them involved in coming to Washington to participate and bring people from their state. So you mm -hmm. they learn to walk the halls of Congress. Mm -hmm. So if in your state your issue is not trade, but it's trade also plus something else, when you go to your congressperson's office, you talk about the foreign policy issue, but you also talk about domestic agenda as it affects you in your state. It makes a huge difference to your congressperson to see you in Washington oh, okay. as opposed to when he comes home because everybody wants to know they have their people mm -hmm. coming on the hill to talk. And so it's a culture we're still trying to change. Okay. And I'm mm -hmm. telling you that's the hardest thing because you're coming from cultures where first of all the parliaments are so small, nobody hardly knows where the parliament office is. They can't find their MP mm -hmm. half of the time. So they're not used to this idea of demanding uh -huh. of their politicians something. Mm -hmm. In the Caribbean, as I say, we are the ones that they pay to vote for them. You know, you come mm -hmm. with your sawfish and your free beer and something, and you throw $5 in a crowd. Whereas here, we pay into the system by saying we're going to support your uh, uh, campaign. And in return, I'm a voter. I come to your campaign. I want X. Mm -hmm. And that's the shift that we're asking Caribbean people to make in order to really... Um, 
help us to navigate the very t tumultuous waves of change mm -hmm. that we're going through in this country. Okay. Now, now Veronica, I want to ask uh, from a historical perspective, okay? Um, I, there was a book I was reading, uh, Najaso, A Catalyst for Change, written by Carol Machette Kirk. And she had the section in there on Caribbean American history where she talks about the uh, contributions beginning in 1672. And she highlighted uh, the, the major uh, international conflict, or I won't say national and international conflicts um, from the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. to the Civil War. Or the, the, during major uh, periods of conflict, there were migrations. Uh -huh. The migration that formed this community, the Hartford community, during World War II. I want you to talk about that. Can you just give us some reflection on the, the development and, and the establishment of this community was during that migration? Oh, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the manpower program was developed during the World War II era where uh, the U.S. Um, asked England if they would uh, loan them the manpower from their Caribbean um, areas to come and work here because again all the men in this country was away the bulk of them were away at war and at first it wasn't just tobacco it was actually working in the factories mm -hmm. so the first wave of men who came here came here came to um, New Jersey Mm -hmm. out in the Midwest in mm -hmm. factories loading bombs, some of the bombs mm -hmm. that were then transported. It was their responsibility to somehow make sure that those things were proper, properly um, loaded and then prepared to go back into war. And my father, who was one of the, those original individuals, mm -hmm. talked about coming to New Jersey and, and doing peace work. As now, he did he come on the Washington Square? It, it was you know, I actually don't know. 45? Yeah, I know he, start, he started coming in mm -hmm. the mid 40s, mm -hmm. but actually, what ship he came on, that was never documented mm -hmm. by him. But he did have a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, horror stories, some of them, and others, funny stories of him having to come to this country, many times landing in places like Florida, New Orleans, and then tra being transported by bus from there mm -hmm. uh, to places like New Jersey. And one of the, um, he did that during the 40s and the late 40s and early 50s. And he talked about his experience once where they're all loaded on a bus. And because they're here as British subjects, they are protected. Um, they always had some official person on that bus with them as they traveled through the South. So they would stop at restaurants and they would demand that the owners of these restaurants is demanding that all the black folks, including them, go to the back and mm. get their food mm. through the back door. And the West Indians who were on this bus saying, if we're gonna eat here, we're mm. gonna eat inside. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and like, if we don't get to eat, we're gonna mm. create a lot of havoc. <laughs> so I don't know, again, because they're protected, they didn't mm -hmm. get lynched. I'm thinking, oh my God, they could have been lynched. <laughs> wow. And then I wouldn't even be in existence. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they would, um, so they, got, they allowed them mm -hmm. to be able to get their food and either mm -hmm. sit there and eat or be able to take it through the front. And my father said the African Americans who came up, they didn't allow them in and they would, you know, dutifully go to the back and get. And he always was puzzled and he, was, he would say, Veronica, I can't understand these people. Why they would even buy that ice cream? If that was me, I would go home and buy the material and make my ice cream. Mm -hmm. His mother used to mm -hmm. make the ice cream, so he mm -hmm. thinks it's that mm -hmm. easier. So, and I tried to explain to him, Dad, you've never been subjected to seeing your brother or your child hung in front of you or be murdered. Mm -hmm. You know, that's probably be why they didn't do it, because mm -hmm. they know if they did anything else, that night maybe they mm -hmm. wouldn't even live to see the next day. Mm -hmm. But they were just very um, insistent that they would never function under mm -hmm. those circumstances. But again, you just don't know given the situation here. So those people came 
not only to work in those factories, but later on, apparently, they did so well that many of the farms, when they were short of labor, also went back to this manpower program. So mm -hmm. even when the war was over, they were invited back to start picking apples and, and oranges. In Florida, they did sugar canes there in mm -hmm. the summertime. And in, as the, um, when that was over, they would ship them by mm -hmm. bus to come to Connecticut to do mm -hmm. the farm. And many of the West Indians worked with people like Martin Luther King. Mm, I remember he came who They as also a tried to bring right. Southerners up mm -hmm. to do the same work. Right. They just wasn't able mm -hmm. to get enough people to do right. that. And that's what, how the Manpower Program. So after the first wave of folks went back to Jamaica, the second wave came back to work on the farms. Mm -hmm. And many of them saw the dollars, you know, mm -hmm. how valuable you know, the money, even though they were being paid like pennies mm -hmm. to pick up um, per hour or per piece of item that they had to pick, it still was more than many of them would make living in Jamaica. My father background is mm -hmm. farming. My, mm -hmm. His parents were farmers and bakers, mm -hmm. and he never really wanted to stay in the country areas. Mm -hmm. He always wanted to be in the city, but there was no work for him in the city. Mm -hmm. So he saw this as a golden opportunity to come here and he also wanted to bring his family here because now he was exposed to a different um, lifestyle and felt that for educational purposes, his kids could do well. And I would say 90% of the men who came here stayed mm -hmm. or tried to figure out a way to stay for that very purpose. It's mm -hmm. to, for a better life for their kids and especially when it came to education. All of them had the dream of mm -hmm. going back home. Mm -hmm. They came mm -hmm. here to work, and, and they felt money. they would mm -hmm. work, make some money, and they were always wa wanting to go back home. Mm -hmm. And some of them were able to see that materialize because mm -hmm. they'd send their money home. It Now, when you think about Jamaica, that foreign exchange that Jamaicans away from Jamaica send is probably bigger than tourism in mm -hmm. terms of the capital that mm -hmm. Um, gets funneled into that country on a yearly basis. So mm -hmm. that is really how Hartford got started. And through that, remember many of these men married African American women. Mm -hmm. But those that didn't My father being one. <laughs> was able to go back to mm -hmm. Jamaica mm -hmm. and marry their sweethearts there and mm -hmm. bring those people up. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, after a while, these men who worked for many of the Jews and Italian also saw a need for housekeepers. Mm -hmm. And uh, before this, a lot of the Southern women were coming to serve as housekeeper. They mm -hmm. started to uh, bring in domestic workers mm -hmm. to Connecticut to work in West Hartford, Avon, Wethersfield. Now, an interesting story that I learned years later uh, my mother came here, and she didn't work as a domestic init uh, initially, but a lot of her friends worked as domestics. They would live in the Albany Avenue area, take the bus into West Hartford, work a few days, and then take the bus back out. So they would all meet at a bus station. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never understood, as black folks, why other black folks were so mean to mm -hmm. us when we came here and, and, you know, beat us up in school, beat us up after school. And I'm like, we look alike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is this? Mm -hmm. And years later, my sister who was born here, mm -hmm. she was working with the Milner family, one member of the Milner family mm -hmm. in, um, at Etna. Mm -hmm. And he's turned to her one day, he says, you Jamaicans aren't all that bad. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> now, my sister was born here, but she mm -hmm. was more, Jam she's more Jamaican mm -hmm. than me. She speak mm -hmm. heavy of Patua mm -hmm. and the whole bit. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he just assumed she was Jamaican. Mm -hmm. So he says, you Jamaicans aren't that bad. <laughs> she says, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. He says, well, and he tells her this story about his grandmother who mm -hmm. was a, came to Connecticut and was working as a domestic in West Hartford. And they would gather at the bus station but they were only they were getting less than a dollar an hour. Mm -hmm. So this said day, they all agreed that on a Thursday they would not go to work. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a strike so that these women would pay them more than this dollar an hour. 
Now, these Jamaican women just came, and they don't have no concept of what a strike is. They just knew that this is more money than they were making in Jamaica, and they needed this job. They have their kids to send money home to. So initially, they agreed, but when they thought about it, they said, oh, no, we're going to lose that job. We're not going to do. So the day that all the African-American women stayed home, mm -hmm. the West Indian women went to work. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, the oh, Jew them. says, oh, these are very loyal people. They mm -hmm. do a good job. They clean well, and they're obedient. Mm -hmm. So they started firing mm -hmm. and replacing the women who came from the South with these women who came wow. from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine now, these women would go home, and with their families, they're cussing and they're upset because they're thinking these people have come from outside the country stealing their jobs. Mm -hmm. So these kids have to listen to this at mm -hmm. home, so no, no wonder they weren't very happy with us mm -hmm. when they meet us at school. So I, I learned that in mm -hmm. the last 10 years mm -hmm. um, about that, so, and I could so understand, you know, yeah. the feelings this, this behind is, this it. Is all, this is all uh, very, very insightful. Yeah, very, very, very I was think so actually, and this is really part of the conversation we have to have as we talk about moving forward mm -hmm. with this concept of a multicultural black America, mm -hmm. the term that I entered into use in 2010 in mm -hmm. the census. And we really have to have these conversations well, yeah, in order for us yeah. to, quote unquote, survive. Yes, let's, yes, let's, yes, yes, yes. Let's have that conversation, but let's take a break, all right? Because we still have to talk about legislative week, <laughs> which is very important. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. America is a nation of immigrants. Now plenty of people only thinking about Rihanna and Nikki and all them young people. But long before that, we've been coming to this country and helping make this country move towards the best democracy. Did you know that the first black person who published a newspaper was a Jamaican? Yes, mm -hmm. John Rossworm. And did you know that Chicago, a Haitian American, helped to make Chicago what it is? So it's enough of us that make this country great. So celebrate June as National Caribbean American Heritage Month and celebrate it with pride. And we're back with Ms. Veronica Ari Wilson and Dr. Clara Nelson on the Jamaica Diaspora Show. Now, um, Dr. Nelson, uh, there's an important piece to National Caribbean American Heritage Month. And during that period, there's Legislative Week. We need to hear about Legislative Week and the importance and the significance of that week. Talk to us about that. Yes, Caribbean American Legislative Day began in um, 1999. We started under the offices of Congresswoman Donna Christensen from the U.S. Virgin Islands. As we like to call it, she represents America's Caribbean state. Mm -hmm. And uh, they always feel left out, and we really felt that there's a kingship there. And she was our men mentor for many years in teaching us how the hill works. And we basically moved it from a day to like a week of activities in Washington where we have a special events such as, for example, if people say, look, we want to meet with EPA, we we'll organize a side meeting with the EPA or the World Bank or the OAS. There's so many multilateral organizations headquartered in Washington, D.C. that we're able to deal with both the domestic agenda and the foreign policy agenda. And then, of course, we also try to pull in some online programming as well for people who are not able to come. Mm -hmm. So this year, we will again um, do it. And we have this week, the first week of the year, which happens first week of the June, actually, from June 4th to June 8th, which is important because June 5th is World Environment Day mm -hmm. and June 8th is World Ocean Day. And we decided to move to that the week um, in part because we're flipping with the OS General Assembly which normally is the first week and we're the last week. Now they're the last week, so we'll move to the first week because all the embassies will be able to come or send somebody mm -hmm. that they'll be in country, which is critical. What we're doing that week, as I said, for this year, we're trying to have a census event mm -hmm. because, as you know, we're asking people in the different states to launch their complete Caribbean count programming in the month of June. We want to make sure that the Caribbean complete count is part of the larger counting things that have to happen 
because we need our own numbers separate and apart from what you need for the state. So yeah. now, you know, the new book says, okay, write in your race and write your country, which is something we advocated for back in 2010. So we're very excited about this development in the census. Then we also want to do something on the Hill, of course, and we're going to focus our Hill event around the prosperity agenda and the security agenda, which are two critical things that this current administration really cares about. They care mm -hmm. about trade and they care about security. So we're going to ride that wave and have people come up this year. We're having people from CARICOM, we have people from the private sector organizations in the region come up because there's actually a conversation now about the extension of the Caribbean Basin Trade Protection Act, which is critical for many of the countries where they're doing um, garment manufacturing and also mm -hmm. the severe itself where it needs to be extended beyond 2020 and that's coming up next year. So that conversation will take place. And we definitely need to see more people from around the country participate. Because if we have people who are representing states, whether it's Connecticut or Massachusetts or Ohio, Ohio, mm -hmm. I would love to see people from Ohio, because actually the bill is co-sponsored by a Republican from Ohio and a Democrat from Alabama. So we would love to have people from those states show up this year mm -hmm. to say, hey, Congressperson, thank you so much for this bill. I live in your district. Which bill? It's the bill to talk about the extension of the Caribbean Basin Trade and Protection okay. Act. All so right. that's the hot one, the hot button mm -hmm. issue because... But what about H.R. 4939? Well, H.R. 4939 is more a strategic like framework on the which it works. And that's a law that says, in general, the State Department must every three years present to Congress a strategy and every year report to Congress how they're doing on this strategy to make sure the Caribbean is not forgotten as people mm. focus on foreign policy with yes. Israel and hotspots were not f forgotten. So what we're doing is we're tying the prosperity agenda of the strategy with the trade issue because trade is part of prosperity, air traffic issues are part of prosperity, mm -hmm. um, shipping issues are part of prosperity mm -hmm. and security. Mm -hmm. So it's a way as a framework and then there's a detail. So that's how we're organizing the event. So but how do so is this the year that you're going to report on activities relative to H.R. 4939 every in the U.S.? Year, every year we have in our meeting since the bill was passed in 2017. Last year we had a conversation with the State Department. The State Department is now saying that the report will not be ready in time for June, but they are going to have at some time later in the summer the report done. But they will be sending people to attend to tell us how they think they're doing um, in terms of carrying out activities to further um, strengthen the relationship between the United States and America. But we want to be able to say, demand that of them. Because if nobody asks, okay. then we won't hear. All right, speak to the uh, companion paper that uh, the Institute of Caribbean Studies so has, has well, our for support of that. Right. Well, our companion paper has a lot more things that we asked for than they agreed to do, <laughs> right? So we're still organizing around that. And in fact, what we have done is begun to set up working groups and advisory councils of technical experts of Caribbean heritage and friends of the, the Caribbean who we need to partner with to execute some of the things we want to do. So let's mm. take the case of security, for example. Mm. We want to see some of the schools here in the maritime space help us with strengthening our sea cadet program, our sea training program, because a lot of young idle youth who are not working, who don't even know how to scuba dive, and there's a lot more jobs coming up in that area as we deal with climate sure. change issues and, mm -hmm. and, and, and sea level rise, for example. Mm -hmm. We have a security working group, we have an education working group, we have a prosperity group, and we're building that and we're asking for more Caribbean experts people who are actually trade lawyers, mm -hmm. people who are actually finance and banking lawyers, to come in and help us be able to speak truth to power. Because we're not, I mean, we are a small group of people who are the core, but these working groups will help us expand our ability to respond to this very important law. This law has changed the game. Because for the first time, there's a law that says the State Department should or must consult with the diaspora. We cannot allow this law to go and not be utilized. So we're just so delighted that the State Department was impressed enough by our bill, of, uh, by our paper, paper. to mm -hmm. tell us to call it the Diaspora Companion Paper. They're the one that christened it that way. So what, what kind of inputs are going to be put forward at this session? At this session, we are going to focus on the concerns we have about 
lack of funding for security agenda issues. Um, the, the cut in foreign affairs um, numbers, as you know, happened under the Trump administration. We want to advocate to the, the House that, look, we need more support. We need for you to maintain your level of support, not just in terms of talking and whatever, but also funding some work on the ground. Because even though our per capita might be high, because of the small states and the number of crime that is coming to the region, we're still very vulnerable. And our states are very vulnerable to being overrun if we are not careful. So we do need to have that support on the ground. So we're advocating around the, 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 the de-risking issues. We're advocating for the extension of the trade bill. We're advocating for support in the maritime space. And we're advocating that there be a much more robust relationship between the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, which is in America's Caribbean and the Caribbean, because they have a lot more support and expertise oh. in terms of the environment and marine and maritime issues than we do and we need to learn from them so that's what we're advocating for on the hill now at, at, at the other events at the OS we'll be having the ignite Caribbean where we have for the last four years been reaching out identified Caribbean Americans some Caribbean born some born here um, that are doing great things 30 under 30 we're very excited about that program mm. the idea is to begin to have a more intentional intergenerational relationship being built mm -hmm. so that we don't have what has happened in the past where many Caribbean groups kind of fritter away as we age out but we want to be able to start having relationships with young leaders mm -hmm. so that eventually when they get tired of doing their own thing which they're gonna do mm -hmm. they come and say hey I'll join with you mm -hmm. so that's what that's about so we have a really mm -hmm. exciting week planned and we intend to go both on the house side and on the senate side as well okay is there now, any legislation domestically um, relating to the census. Um, mm -hmm. I asked that question mm -hmm. because the census played, um, Connecticut um, was able to identify that the Jamaican population was the fastest growing immigrant population and that was based on the work that we did in the last, uh, prior to the last census to encourage our folks to exactly be counted well, I and know I'm wondering I'm hearing rumors well we, we we are part of a larger organization called the National Coalition for Black Civic Participation oh. we're a member of that group we're actually co-founders of that group it's called the Unity Diaspora I remember. Coalition and we're having a big launch event on June 18th okay. and there are conversations going on with Congressman Clay's office about funding our work uh, because we're hard to reach and hard to count Mm -hmm. So we really are excited. Also, I must tell you also, we most recently, our health group, we partnered with Hampton University. Mm -hmm. Hampton University is launching a Caribbean Health Disparity Center. Mm -hmm. And we partnered, and our contribution was looking out on healthcare futures. Mm -hmm. And we're going to focus a lot on the healthcare ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, it's the hospitals. You might have great nurses and doctors, but mm -hmm. God forbid the hospital and the clinics. They're mm -hmm. not run properly. We don't have a lot of good healthcare administrators. So we want to bring that as what we can offer into the ecosystem, the allied health systems mm -hmm. and the healthcare management wow. systems. And we want to certainly partner with people in Hartford because ha Hartford has a lot of good people oh, sure. in this space that can eventually, well, you know, partner to do the training on the mm -hmm. ground. Well, you've, you've attended Legislative Week. I haven't. I've, I've been to the Invest Caribbean. I've been to the CARA Awards. But can you talk about your experiences at the uh, Legislative Week? Oh, <laughs> it was my first experience okay. the time that I went and it was awesome. Mm -hmm. It really was uh, to be able to get that close to your congressperson um, in an environment where they opened the door. Um, mm -hmm. Senator Dodd was there at the time and we were able to go in. We met as a group. We talked about our issues. He knew why we were there. And then at the end, we had a chance. There were um, opportunities to be engaged in a reception that now you didn't only meet with your congressperson, but you also had key congresspeople from around the country was at that reception. You were able to talk about some of your issues and why it was important. And they were very receptive. Um, the briefing at the White House, yeah. that mm -hmm. was awesome. Mm -hmm. We had a chance to sit in a room and uh, have all the various 
areas of gov government come to us mm -hmm. and talk about all the things that was going on. So that was mm -hmm. the most impressive. Who was doing the brief? Well, how that's done normally, well, this has been a departure in the last year. Um, unfortunately, since we had the first, the first year of the Trump administration, we had one or two people in the White House who were named as outreach people to African American groups. Now there's no burst person that we know of that's named, so we have some of our Caribbean American Republican friends who are part of ICS Elected Advisory Council, which we still do have, of which <laughs> Veronica's mm -hmm. a member. Mm -hmm. um, we have them kind of trying to back channel some stuff to see if we can get that restarted. Because as you know, there was a meeting recently with the prime ministers of several countries, and we have not gotten any read out of what happened. Mm -hmm. So we're not sure if they're going to do it, but we're certainly trying to see if we can, you know, get our friends in the Black Republican Party, the, the Caribbean Republicans, to sort of say, hey, we need to know what was said, and we are asking that a brief be continued as was done from the Bush administration to the to the Obama administration. So we're hoping that this year we can return to that. Um, but normally we ask for people from Treasury Department, we normally ask from DHS, and we ask from Department of Justice at one oh, time. Yeah. We, got, we got people from high level. So it has to be like people who are really at the decision-making tables of these departments come, and it's normally like a two-hour briefing, and then we have a reception. Okay. And one mm -hmm. year, in the last year of the Obama administration, we had actually mm -hmm. Michelle Montana and some other people, mm -hmm. you know, playing Caribbean music. So it was really nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is uh, this is all great uh, information, and I and I hope the viewers are appreciating everything that they're getting here. But we're running out of time. <laughs> 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 we're we're running over You're time. You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, just some closing thoughts. You know, this is National Caribbean American Heritage Month uh, coming up in June. You know, this show is we're aiming for this show to go um, across the U.S. The UK, Canada, Jamaica, of course, um, and certainly our European friends. Um, please give us some closing thoughts. I'll go first. Okay. I would just encourage um, all my elected officials um, from all over the United States to really step up. This has been a long fought battle to have this month, and I think it would be a shame if we let it die or we turn it into just an opportunity for a party. We can do that any month of the year. Uh, the June Caribbean Heritage Month I see as an opportunity to expose our um, young people to what our culture is all about, and it's not only the socializing part, but to the education, what's happening in healthcare with our people, what's happening in government, encouraging them to be more involved, to participate more. And I would just like to see that this month get blown up in a very big way and continue to survive and not just depend on Dr. Claire Nelson mm -hmm. to champion it from Washington. Every state should have every Caribbean person looking forward to be educated during that month, to touch base with their prime ministers and their other government officials, bring those people into your state to meet with uh, the officials in that state and to talk about how they can partnership and work together for a better united front. Thank you. Wow, I think you said it very well because in fact, is exactly what we're about. We want to ensure that people understand that from the Secretary of Treasury, right, Alexander Hamilton, who mm -hmm. was born in the island of Nevis, mm -hmm. to the Haitian soldiers who came to support the Revolutionary War, to the people who came into Charleston to work on slave, in slave plantations, mm -hmm. to the farm workers, to the nurses, to the doctors, to the people who fight Marcus and die Garvey. for America in mm -hmm. the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. We are part of the fabric that is America. Mm -hmm. We're part of this tapestry that is being, still being woven as we speak. And my closing thought is that I really want to see more people, more of mainstream America, be aware of our contributions in a time when people of color who are immigrants are being looked at as a burden to mm -hmm. understand that we have people of color who are inventors, who mm -hmm. have created the things that make your smartphone work. 
Mm -hmm. We have people of color who are Captain American who are in defense intelligence agency monitoring ships that are protecting our country. We have people of color from the Caribbean who have built stuff for the NASA to survive and to mm -hmm. work. So we are contributing to making America great already. And mm -hmm. so it's very important that in this climate, mm -hmm. we have this story being told much more loudly, shouted from the rooftops, mm -hmm. that we too sing America. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, Thank, thank you so much for, for joining the Jamaica Diaspora Show and Hartford Public Access Television. Uh, it's been a privilege to, to have you on the show, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you yeah. for having us. And that's it for the Jamaica Diaspora Show. We'll be back next week with more programming on Hartford Public Access Television.